everyone. Good evening, everyone. Yeah, there you go. How's everybody doing? Good. Um, if you want to go ahead and take your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to the book of Revelation chapter 3. We'll be looking at verses um, 7 through 13 tonight. Chapter 3, 7 through 13. How's everybody doing okay? What is up with this weather, huh? It's crazy. Who would have thought? Crazy. I, we, I was at my mom's the other night on Sunday night, and it was 95 in Tsuki at 9 o'clock in the evening. 95. Isn't that weird? Snow? Oh, praise God. Bring it. I say bring it. Yes, ma'am. It was 105? Where do you live? In the, in the desert? In Socorro? Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy heat. Pray everybody's doing well. Um, again, we do have a handout. For tonight, three total pages, uh, pages one and two front and back. So two physical pages and then a, uh, uh, a single page, which is page three, which is nothing more than kind of a synopsized version of my notes um, so that uh, we can kind of follow along and kind of track. Um, since we are <clears throat> in this one section in the, in the book of Revelation that is dealing with church history, there's a lot of dates a lot of historical facts, so it's useful to maybe just kind of have um, this in your possession so that you could kind of follow along a little bit because I know and um, I'm not, don't want to apologize for it, but I, I'm mindful of the fact that we're throwing a ton of info at you. But uh, just bear with us because once we get past uh, chapters two and three, we're going to get into what... Most folks um, are drawn to the book of Revelation about, not that chapters two and three aren't important, don't get me wrong, they're extremely, extremely important as we've already learned and seen, but uh, again, I just, uh, just want you to be patient because um, there is a lot, a lot of information, uh, historical information that we're throwing at you, but uh, you guys have been extremely flexible and durable in uh, receiving that stuff. Everybody doing good? Yes, Pray you're doing good. Okay, so uh, let's, have a, let's have a word of prayer. We're going to dive right into this. <clears throat> Bear with me a tiny bit. Um, does anybody have like a piece of candy, hard candy? Um, I do have a couple. That would work. I think I'm, um, I think it's like an allergy thing that I'm dealing with a little bit. Thank you so much. That's perfect. Um, so I'm get, <coughs> getting a little bit hoarse. I don't think it's a cold, but... Um, Probably allergy is still dry, yeah. Plus, um, it was so hot. We let our lab in the house last night. Swamp cooler going. It was really cool, and she was like laying right on top of me. <laughs> so I think that's part of it. So better. Uh, I wish. I wish, was, but it's all good. <laughs> that's not good for a Bible study, isn't it? What a start. <laughs> I'm joking, Larry. You know that. I love you. Um, I'm already in trouble. I'm always in trouble. It's all good. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop while I'm ahead. So chapter number three, um, we're in the second to last church. Um, and you'll see what all that means here in a minute. Throw some, some images up on the screen to kind of give you some perspective. And uh, let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for... Lord, for our time together tonight, for, Lord, your goodness, your, uh, your grace, your mercy, your love towards us, Lord, and uh, Lord, even in spite of this, this weather and the temperatures, Lord, we're grateful for uh, each and every day that you give us another breath of air, another heartbeat, and Lord, I pray that we wouldn't lose sight of the blessings that have been bestowed on us, the fact that we're able to gather freely, and, and, and Lord, just, uh, just look to your word, Lord, and discuss and consider um, some very um, profound, significant things or some things that as believers we need to be mindful of so that history doesn't repeat, herself, repeat itself, Lord, 
within the context of the church, but also in our individual lives. Lord, I'm just so grateful for what you have been revealing to us in this study. Uh, Lord, thank you for uh, your spirit and the promise that um, has been bestowed upon the body of Christ, Lord God, that you are going to lead us into all truth, Lord. And that's all we ask is that uh, we look to you, Lord, for the truth that we need so that we can better understand the day and age and the times and the seasons in which we find ourselves. Again, Lord, thank you for your people here tonight. Open our hearts, open our minds, and be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, folks. Um, we're just, again, just by way of just five, ten-minute review. Um, you guys are pretty much, I think, tracking along with me, knowing and understanding where we're finding ourselves in our study. We have been, um, again, um, applying this very important principle of Bible study. And those of you that have your How to Study the Bible booklet, uh, you're mindful of the fact that even in these explicit studies, whether it be our study in Thessalonians on Sunday mornings or Revelation on Wednesday nights or any other book that we look to, um, we're always applying these principles of Bible study. The first four in your little booklet are really the foundational ones. If you can really memorize those four and really be sensitive to how they apply, um, the Word of God will open up in an incredible way to you. Obviously, uh, Five, six, and seven, and eight are also important. All 15 are important, but the foundation ones are really key. Uh, the first one being context. And, and again, it's important that we always understand the context of a book, chapter, or verse, even the big picture as it relates to the Bible, right? We all know that the theme of the Bible is nothing more than a battle for a kingdom and a throne. And as long as you could keep that perspective and that understanding of God's word, that really sets the stage for you Uh, grasping and being able to understand the rest of the Bible and how it's put together for you and for me. So as you understand um, the big picture, which is uh, a battle for a kingdom, um, we know and we understand that there is going to be a literal, a physical kingdom on this planet sooner than later that is going to be established by none other than our Lord Jesus Christ. You'll you'll see that in a a graphic here in a minute and how and where that event's going to play out. Um, but also, there's also an important spiritual application that we should consider um, in the New Testament, knowing and realizing that your heart, um, your this deep inner sanctum where the Spirit of God dwells, is also a throne in which the Spirit of God desires to dwell, to be on the throne of our heart so that He can govern us and be what He needs to be uh, in our life and in our journey. So, those four foundational principles are key context. You guys are mindful and aware that principle number two is the principle of peoples. The Bible is written to three very distinct groups, the Jews, the Gentiles, and the church. We'll kind of see how and where those things play out as we start getting into the, the heart of our study. Uh, principle number three is the principle of time. Timelines are significant in Scripture. Time is something that God created. Genesis chapter 1, verse 14. And he... he uh, He created time and he established time the way he did so that he could bring redemption and restoration to a fallen kingdom. Um, I don't know whether you know it or not or realize that, but the reason why we exist is so that the Lord could restore and to replenish a a mutiny that occurred way back in eternity past, a rebellion, a mutiny that was led by none other than Lucifer, And this timeline, these two timelines that you find in the Bible are for the sole purpose are to restore, to redeem. That's what he's always about. And then principle number four is what we have been focusing a lot in this particular study, and that is the three applications of Scripture, right? Um, There's a historical application. That being said, uh, one of the images that we throw up every Wednesday night is this map of what is modern day Turkey. And we know from history or even from the Bible in the book of Acts, this part of the map in what is Turkey today is known as Asia. Uh, In theological circles, it's known as Asia Minor. So if you're reading a a Bible theological uh, church history book, they'll refer to it as Asia Minor. In the book of Acts, it's referred to as Asia. That being said, 
in the book of Revelation, you find the seven churches of Asia Minor found in chapters 2 and 3. We started historically by looking at this map with the first church being Ephesus, Revelation chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Then we made our way down, looked at the church of Smyrna, uh, then Pergamos, then um, Thyatira. Last week we looked at Sardis. Tonight we're looking at the church. See the little red dot? The little red dot is Philadelphia. Yes, spelled the same way as the city of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania. Everybody knows what the word Philadelphia means, right? Brotherly love. love. Yes, it does. And uh, we're going to look at some of those truths here tonight. And then, as we have already seen and we've already learned, the last church that we're going to discuss that we're going to cover last week, the last church that is mentioned, I'm going to show you doctrinally where that applies, is the church of Laodicea. That's right. Good job. So... um, this is the historical application. If you look at the little green dot in the kind of bottom left-hand corner where it says Patmos, this is where John, the apostle, is actually on this island. It's a penal colony, and this is happening right around 90 AD. And um, I'll talk a little bit more in a minute as we look at the, the Revelation uh, chart. But uh, historically, he's in this map, and God reveals to him everything that's going to play out um, in, um, in the Bible prophetically his, or pro, in the, pro, prophetically from 90-80 on. So uh, there's your context historic, historically. We also like to impart to you what we call the doctrinal application, which is the second application of our how to study the Bible principle. And that simply implies or reveals to us what we refer to often as our prophetic application. What does that mean? is that these seven churches on the map um, also are revealing to us and providing you and me a really, really in- in- impressive outline of what we know in the Bible as church history. The last 2,000 years from the book of Acts, 33 AD, from the time that Jesus ascends in Acts chapter 1, or even Pentecost, depends on where you want to uh, draw that particular line, um, up until the rapture of the church, we're dealing with 2,000 years of church history prophetically and what the spirit of god has given us in these two chapters chapters two and three is this amazing outline that describes in great detail the characteristics explicit characteristics of the church age it's amazing and incredible as we've already been able to connect some of those dots so i think in your in your notebook you should have a little diagram with seven little church buildings and this is what i would refer to as your your um, prophetic or your doctrinal application. And uh, again, we use uh, 2 Thessalonians chapters 2, verse 7. Bear with me, because when we get into the second letter to the Thessalonians, we'll talk about this seven, this sixth of seven mysteries that are revealed to us in the word of God. And uh, this mystery that we're referring to in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 is a very profound truth that Paul writes to the believers in Thessalonica in his second letter, reminding them or revealing to them that once this thing called the church age is launched, which was really not something they were fully able to grasp because the believers in Thessalonica, just like you and I today, um, are waiting for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they were just as as pressed and just as is um, excited about his return. Obviously, they weren't, they weren't given the level or the amount of what, what I would revert to as um, uh, not necessarily divine revelation, but... Um, um, ah, shoot. It'll come to me later uh, tonight when I'm asleep. But anyway, um, progressive revelation, where God progressively provides revelation uh, throughout church history even. So... Um, John, again, keep in mind, this, the book of Revelation is written some 40 years after the, both the first and second letters to the Thessalonians, right? So they didn't fully grasp all that God was going to reveal. So this little a diagram here, this little chart reveals to us a, a doctrinal application historically. And what Paul reveals to the Thessalonians in verse number seven of that second chapter is the fact 
that uh, once this thing called the church age is launched, um, that there will be a continual decline. Um, this is known as the um, this is known as the uh, the apostasy, if you will, of the church. That that uh, all know I know that a lot of us are desiring and wanting a a revival, and there is going to be a revival. You're going to learn, and you're going to see exactly how and where that happens when we get into the Book of Revelation. But during the church age, what we're actually witnessing, and you guys are mindful of this, we're seeing a decline, right? And wait till we look at the book of, wait till we cover the, um, the church of Thessalonica um, next week. I'm sorry, the church of Laodicea next week. You're going to see some of the characteristics of that age. So um, yeah, it's, so what you're seeing here is a really fascinating um, account of church history from a prophetic doctrinal application. That being said, if you look at the first church way over on the left, this was the first church period, which goes from roughly 33 AD to 200 AD, known as the Ephesian, the, uh, Ephesian period, the apostolic church, um, which means what? Fully purposed. God used um, these several verses in the book of Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And again, look at it, some of the characteristics that we covered way back that reveal to us the significance and the foundation that was revealed to us with the uh, apostolic church. The second church was known as the Smyrna period, and that was from 200 AD to 325 AD, if you remember from our study. The word Smyrna means bitterness and death. This was a, 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 this was a really sad and very um, heartbreaking period in church history. This is where pagan Rome came down extremely hard on the early church and the believers during that period, 200 to 325 AD, massacring by the millions. This is when the uh, Nero Circus becomes prevalent in history and the Colosseum, and they're literally uh, looking and finding Christians for the sole purpose of persecuting them, killing them, destroying them. Um, obviously, we know from history that whenever the church or believers are persecuted, that it booms, right? Look at what's been going on in Iran in this day and age and in China, uh, in places like that. That being said, whenever there's persecution, the church will boom, will explode, and that's what, exactly what began to happen in that period. So lo and behold, the Roman emperor of the day, Constantine, in 325 AD, um, comes to this realization that, man, how do I stop this, this overwhelming growth of Christianity? So... Um, conveniently, he lets everybody know that he saw this cross, this vision in the sky at the Mil Battle of Milvan Bridge when he was battling with a northern uh, Italian emperor. And um, from that point on, Constantine accepts Christianity and, and uh, becomes technically the first pope, if you will, in roughly 325 AD. And this is why that period is known as the Pergamus period, is because you find uh, pagan Rome... Um, integrating or mixing or marrying um, Christianity. So this is where you find the first council of Nicaea come to bear and these councils become to be established so they could bring about their theological, um, their theology and their liturgy and all the other things that are going to make up the early part of the Roman church. Can you leave the, the church buildings up please for, for now? So as you make your way down, you start to see this digression, if you will, and um, we refer to that particular church period as the compromising church, or it means much marriage. As I mentioned a few weeks ago, uh, you find the church marrying the world. Um, really a sad time. That's not to say that the true believers didn't stay true to their beliefs. They were having to hide in catacombs and other very obscure places in the Roman Empire. Um, but you find this really interesting mix. And this is where I would say to you that Christendom, not Christianity, but Christendom, uh, specifically as it relates to the Western church, is actually birthed. And then we talked about the church of Thyatira, right? This is the fourth of the seven churches. Uh, this becomes the peak of the Roman uh, Christendom kingdom. This mixture becomes extremely prevalent. Uh, we refer to it as 
this odor of affliction. This is the, the, where the dark ages, people don't refer to it as the dark ages anymore because that's not politically correct to use that term, but it's the middle ages, if you will. Um, this is the peak of the Roman kingdom. Um, and as we saw last week, um, we discussed and we covered the fifth church, um, which is the, uh, the, um, um, the church of Sardis. We uh, refer to this at the, as the afflicted church, which means um, red ones is the literal definition of Sardis. And this was another very, very dark period in church history. Um, this time, at this stage, at this point, um, no longer is, um, is just the, the pagan Roman Empire that is persecuting believers, but now it's the papal empire that is persecuting, as we saw last week. The persecution is heavy, it's dark. This is where the Inquisition begins to show up historically, and um, the Sardis period goes on from 1,000 to about 1,500 A.D. So this is where we find ourselves tonight. So if you look at the church that we're going to cover tonight, um, which is the church period of the Church of Philadelphia, it's the only one that stands out by itself, doesn't it? Even in the graphic. You know why that is? It was a really unique period in church history. It was a period in church history that uh, in spite of the darkness, in spite of the devil's attacks, um, man, it became this amazing period where God just moved in an incredibly mighty way. And uh, we're going to look at some of those things that happened during this particular period known as the Philadelphian church period. Excited. Uh, my heroes in the faith, guys that I like to read about, guys that I have their books and their devotions come out of this church period. These guys were not only doctrinally and theologically sound in their beliefs, but man, they had this amazing spiritual connection with the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a result, they were able to impact the world. Uh, just an amazing period, incredible period in church history. It's known as the period of brotherly love. It's known as the, evangel uh, the evangelistic church, right? In other words, the gospel was going out in a massive incredible way and there was nobody or nothing that anybody could do however the devil as you'll see in the bible tonight you see these characteristics begin to show up does this really interesting uh counterfeit maneuver right if he can't persecute it if he can't directly counter the church you know what he does he counterfeits it he begins to counterfeit and i'm going to share with you tonight how he began to counterfeit the body of Christ in this church period. I wonder if you guys have any thoughts about when and how that might have played out. But just an, a fascinating period in history. And uh, this period goes on from about 1500 AD to 1900. It was an amazing period. We're going to talk tonight about some of the significant events that played out during the Philadelphian period. Again, keep in mind, as we delve into our study in the book of Revelation, um, the focus is, is events, right? If you remember from our study last fall, moving into, into January, when we were looking at the Matthew 24 and the Olivet Discourse, we, um, we, had, we did a really cool series titled The Signs of the Times. And we covered 10 very significant signs. And again, what I wanted and what I want to remind you of, it's important that you go back and maybe... And, and these, uh, these teachings are online. The videos are online if you want to go back and look at them. Um, it's a series that we did just in the last several months uh, because just like signs that are out there in, in orange barrels and orange cones when you're getting ready to get to a construction zone or a zone where they're working, those things are to prepare us for events, for the actual event. And that's really what and why we did what we did last fall when we looked at the... Um, Signs of the Time series, because now we're looking at events. Our focus from here on out, we're gonna, uh, there's going to be those things that, uh, uh, that are going to play out, uh, that are going to play out um, in a really uh, extreme and even a radical way um, as we start delving into the text. Having said that, uh, I want to throw this, so we've given you a historical perspective or histo historical application with the map. This is the doctrinal application. Next week, we'll be looking at the last church that is mentioned, Laodicea. Wait till we cover this one, man. You're going to be blown away with 
how much it reveals to much about the characteristics that we're dealing with today. So that being said, um, I also want to give you a contextual application, if you will, and it's your book of Revelation chart, and most of you should have it in your books, and it looks like this. If you don't have this, let us know, um, or actually Elizabeth has all this stuff posted on the website. By the way, I uploaded the last group of files today, okay, just so you know, if you want to get those up there, but this chart is really, really important to understand. If you want to understand how to rightly divide the word of truth, just like Paul revealed to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, he says, he says very explicitly, study God's word, Timothy, so that you can rightly divide his word. Well, the word of God is div- divided in a number of areas. Obviously, a real obvious one is Old and New Testament, right? Well, there's also divisions in books like the book of Revelation. This is what we're trying to depict with this particular, with this particular chart. Um, if you look at on the left, upper left-hand corner, Revelation 1.10 and 1.19, those two verses are really key. They're really, really key verses in understanding the structure of the book of Revelation, right? We know from the 10th verse, if you want to go back and read Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 10. Um, look with me really, uh, really quick. Um, look at verse 9. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and, pat- and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos. There's your map or your historical perspective. For the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 10. This is a key verse. Uh, it says in the 10th verse, I was in the spirit on the what? On the Lord's day. So it begs the question, when is the Lord's day? That's a question that you ought to be asking immediately in your, on, in your mind, right? Do you remember when that day is? Maureen, do you remember when that is? It's the second coming of Christ. If you look at that chart, when's the second coming of Christ? Over that red arrow pointing down is the second coming of Christ. That's the whole theme of the Bible, by the way. The return of Christ so that he could, what? Restore his kingdom. So he can set up his kingdom, right? So when he comes back, so here John has been literally, I'm not talking about visions now. He's literally been transported into the future. And then you get to the 19th verse, which is another key verse in the, in the, in the first chapter. And it's, these are Jesus' words. For those of you that have a red letter Bible, he says this to him. All right, John. Now that I've put you in this, in this event, the second coming of Christ, he says, these things that I'm going to reveal to you, I says, I want you to write the things which thou hast what? Seen. Thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be what? Hereafter. Hereafter. There's three tenses that are revealed to John that he's expected to write about. So if he's sitting at the second coming... He's sitting out here, and God is revealing to him some things. He says, all right, everything I'm going to reveal to you, I want you to do in three tenses, the things which thou hast seen. Past tense, right? What's the past tense events? Everything that we have been talking about over the last several weeks regarding the what? The church age. When did the church age begin? Look at your chart. When did the church age begin? 3380 at the cross. That's kind of a little implication. We could give it 40, 50 days, give and take, right? Pentecost, the ascension. We're not going to be hyper dispensationalists and, and, and force the issue, but this is when the church age began. And when's it going to end? At the rapture. That's when the church age ends. So he tells him, everything I'm going to reveal to you, I want you to, re- to write these things down historically. And that's exactly what he does. So what we have been looking at in these last chapters, chapters 2 and 3, right? We have been looking at the amazing thing, this amazing outline that the Spirit of God has put in his word, outlining all the things that are going to happen historically in the church age. Are we in the church age right now? Yes. How do we know we're in the church age? Florence, I, I saw Florence do this. How do we know we're in the church age? Talk to me, Florence, because I saw you do this. I'm kind of call you out. How do we know? Somebody speak up. 
you're still here. Maybe we, risk, maybe we missed the rapture last night. I don't know. So we're all going to go through the chain, right? Not that, well, you're still here. So if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you received him as your savior and he's indwelling you right now, guess what? You're part of the church. Three times in the New Testament, Romans 10, Galatians 3.18, and Colossians 1.18, the Bible says there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek in the New Testament, in the church age. God doesn't care about your religion, your background. The issue is, have you made him your personal savior? Jew or Greek, Jew or Gentile. Because regardless of who you are, if you receive him as your personal savior, guess what? You are now part of the body of Christ. You are now part of the church. And I say the body of Christ because the body of Christ has revealed to us that phrase and term in what, within what context? Ephesians 5, within the context of marriage. You know what the whole purpose for this event, wait till we get there, is Jesus is bringing his bride home, the bride of Christ. Who's his bride? You, the church. The church right now today? No. The church is made up of people that have existed from, from 33 AD till today. That's the body of Christ. Remember, remember our study in Thessalonians a few weeks back, chapter number four? The dead in Christ will what? Will what? Will rise first, and then those that are alive will what? Meet them in the... I love what George did with this diagram. We're going to meet them in the clouds. We're going to meet him just right above the, 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 what the Bible would refer to in Psalms 148 as the first heaven. And then we're all going to gather there and we're going to be with him forever. So when we get to chapter number four, we're going to hang out and we're going to cover some of the events in this little red box. In fact, I'm going to briefly mention one of them tonight. These are heavenly events that will be taking place while... God begins to do what he's going to do for seven years from chapter 6 through 19. This is known in the Bible as the tribulation period. Seven years of antichrist rule. The new world order is in power. It's in place. And everything that we're seeing coming to fruition and the convergence of all these events and signs, if you will, are actually going to be applied. I've used this little metaphor or illustration a number of times the stage is set like never before anybody ever been to a um the opera or every time i go to the opera i always fall asleep so i don't even know what they're about um who's going i'll pray for you (laughs) save me a seat so i could sleep Uh, but you know when you go to the opera or you go to the theater Uh, one of the things that you'll see are these incredible sets that they develop, right? In fact, my neighbor, Gilbert Blea, was one of the main set guys way back in the incredible carpenter. And um, that was his job, was to develop these sets. And um, here's my point. The sets are in place. The only thing that hasn't shown up are the actors. Act one is on the verge of happening. And that's going to happen when you get to this part, the things which are, the present tense, if you will. So if he's sitting here, God's going to reveal to him all this stuff. Now, there's two parts to the tribulation period. It's divided perfectly in half. You'll see that in three different, as three different time elements are revealed to you in that portion of the text. Uh, You're going to see the phrase time, times, and a half a time. In other words, one, two, that's three and a half a year. You're going to see uh, that the tribulation will be 1,260 days, which is exactly 300 and, um, three and a half years. You're also going to see the actual phrase three and a half years. That last three and a half years, as Jesus referred to it in Matthew chapter number 24, verse number 16, he referred to it as the what? The great tribulation. This is the part of the tribulation of the book of Revelation that freaks everybody out. This is where things are going to get really heavy on planet Earth. So that's the gist. And then uh, there's a second event. Remember I shared with this with you? The book of Revelation is divided into three parts by these two events here. The rapture in, Reve- in Revelation chapter 4 verse 1. <coughs> two places in the book, in the book of Revelation where heaven opens. 
Revelation 4, 1, somebody goes up. Revelation 19, 11, somebody comes down. This is the second coming. So when Jesus returns, and I'm going to share with you a really cool, we're going to follow his path. Um, this is not going to be a single event where he comes down from heaven and he's in Jerusalem. No, he's going to start way down in the Sinai and he's going to make up, right, Dennis, it's still there to this day, the King's Highway, all the way up along the, the Saudi and the Jordanian border and what is known as the King's Highway to this day. I wonder why it's called this King's Highway. Um, maybe because the king is going to take that route. He's going to make his way all the way up north Those of you that are going to be going to Israel with me in February, uh, we're going to visit the city that he grew up in called Nazareth. And just to the south of the city of Nazareth is this place that I absolutely love visiting called the Nazareth Ridge. And um, think about this for a second. Jesus grew up there as a 12-year-old little boy, probably made his way to the ridge and pondered the day that he's going to make his way what is known as the Jezreel Valley which is the Battle of Armageddon, where where the gloves come off. That whole valley from all the way from the east all the way to the west, which is Megiddo, um, Mount Carmel, where Elijah battled with the the prophets of Baal. All that stuff is happening in this amazing valley. And then Jesus, as he destroys all these Antichrist armies, will ultimately make his way down into Jerusalem, the Mount of Olives, and... um, the uh, judgment of the nations and this amazing, incredible earthquake that will occur, Zechariah chapter number 12, that will split the, the Kedron Valley right there in Jerusalem. And uh, then he'll set up his kingdom. Are you ready for this? He'll set up his kingdom for how long? A thousand. thousand years. The millennial reign of Christ. Finally, everything that we have been, even as... Roman Catholics back in the day when we used to pray the Lord's Prayer, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy what? Kingdom Kingdom come what? Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. See, those are just words to most of us, right? No, those words are mentioned in two places, Matthew 6 and Luke 11. Jesus has always been about establishing his kingdom on this earth. Is it present today? No, we know that, right? Whose kingdom is it today? It is. 2 Corinthians 4 refers to the devil as what? The God of this world. Well, here's what's cool. Although you're in this world, you're not of this world. That's what we can't lose sight of. Because of who lives inside of you, you're spiritual beings. The thing that's keeping you limited and hindering is what? This thing. That's the church age thing. So once we're out of here, man, things go back to an Old Testament approach to everything. Everything's literal again. Literal battles, literal physical battles, but everything in the New Testament is what? Spiritual. Spiritual. So I hope that makes sense. So we're finding ourselves right here in the church age, and this is the beat and the heartbeat of everything that this whole thing is about. So let's dive right into our outline. This is what it looks like. It's the same one that we have been looking at over the last several weeks. We're going to be looking at the characteristics of Philadelphia the commendation of Philadelphia, um, the condemnation, just to stay true to our outline, I um, left that in there, and then the charge that he gives gives the Philippian believers. Um, If you look at your notes, are you able to bring that up, Larry, that outline? The, The outline? It's a black screen. The four points. That one, thank you. These are the characteristics. Look at verse seven. We're gonna look at the characteristics of of Philadelphia, the church of Philadelphia. Then it's commended in chapters verse verse eight and 10. It's commended significantly. You know what you don't find in this church, which is really cool? A condemnation. There's no condemnation that the spirit of God, that that, that Jesus gives his church because because of what's going on and what they represent and what's going on in that period of church history. And then we'll look at the last three verses, 11, 12, and 13, and (coughs) consider this amazing charge that he gives this church. Um, There's only two of the seven churches that aren't condemned for any reason where they're not told to repent. There's there's nothing that they need to change from. Who can remember the second one? Or actually the first one before Philadelphia. That's right, it was Smyrna. Why Smyrna again? 
I know you know. It was the second church. You're right. You're absolutely right, Kathy. You remember? Why the church of Smyrna? The persecuted church, man. They were staying true to their beliefs. They were staying true to the word of God. They were staying true to who they were. And pagan Rome came down hard, man. And uh, here we find ourselves. All right? So looking at Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, let's follow along and read the text with me. This is how this particular section, this particular church is addressed. Everybody or anybody here have a red letter Bible? All right. All red letters, huh? The entire chapters two and three. Oh, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thanks. I could use that. Right? What's the, um, what are we implying? And I know I kind of beat this dead horse, but it's important. If you look at these two chapters, chapters two and three, every single word is read. These are Jesus' words, man, to these seven churches, to these seven angels that represent these seven churches. So look at how it begins. And unto the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write these things, saith he that is holy, and he that is true, and he that hath the key of David. Isn't that awesome? The Spirit of God reminding these believers of the holiness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, what an amazing period. What is, what is God revealing to the believers during this time, 1500 A.D. to 1900 A.D.? The greatness and the goodness of God. Isaiah chapter 6 stuff, right? This is something that you and I forget. I often get frustrated with these athletes that often refer to the Lord as what? The man of stairs. Man, I hate when I hear that. I really do it. It annoys me to no end. I was sharing with Larry the other day, uh, a couple days ago. Um, You guys know that I like football, and I kind of like the Chiefs. I don't know if I like them anymore. I don't know. I may... I may really go turn cone and start cheering for the Raiders. I'm just joking. I could never do that. I could never do that. But anyway, um, there's a new series on Netflix called Quarterback. I don't know if you guys are aware of that. And the Chiefs quarterback, Patrick Mahomes, that is basically on every commercial today, um, is one of the guys that they're, um, what's the term? They're focusing on, I guess. And... Um, I watched all of 30 minutes and 45 minutes of that show because that guy has a disgusting mouth. And what I shared with my wife, and I'm going to say this online to all the Chiefs fans that are probably joining us from Kansas City right now, I was so turned off because this is a dude before every game kneels down at the goalpost and he's praying to God and then he has this every other word during the game is the whatever, the F word. It's like, come on, dude. Turned it off, man. I'm done. I'm done. So, Kenny, I'm going to, can you get me a Bronco cap for next week? <laughs> I'm serious. No, you know, seriously, it's just, we've lost the importance and the significance of who Christ is. We really have. You want to know why we're late to see him? Because these guys profess who they are and what they are, and then they do and say what they do. Because these dudes and dudettes, because there's some amazing women that show up in this period, had a grasp of who Jesus was. Is why God used them and took them to a whole other level like no other period in church history. Yeah, Steve? Yeah, I would agree. You started watching it too, huh? I would agree with that. Yeah, we'll talk about that next week. Bottom line, I was I was pretty turned off. I was pretty disgusted. But anyway, that said, um, I don't know. Holiness, man. He's not the man upstairs. He's not just a good teacher. He's not just some historical being that existed and did what he did. No, man. He's Almighty God. And, uh, man, his plan and his purpose is so significant. And look at how the Spirit of God, look at how Jesus addresses these guys. These things saith he that is holy and he that is true. Again, what's truth in the Word of God? Jesus in John chapter 4, 14, verse 6, says something really significant and profound to the disciples, right? I am the what? I am the way, 
the truth, and the life. And no man cometh to the Father but by me. I was having this discussion, almost a debate the other day with a gentleman that was saying, that's not what the Bible says. It says Jesus is a way. No, you're a way. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. I just heard a, a Mexicano call another Mexicano way the other day. I'm not sure why. Maybe you guys could enlighten me someday. But anyway, but no, he's the way. He's the truth, right? Jesus goes on and he takes that whole truth thing to a whole other level. In John chapter 17, verse number 17, as he goes to the Father on our behalf and he says to the Father, I'm getting ready to leave, Lord. They're going to have it hard. There's going to be some difficulties, some trials in their lives, but sanctify them. Set them apart for this amazing purpose. And then in that same verse, he says, sanctify them through thy truth. Are you ready for this? Thy word. Thy word, Jesus, is truth. So he's the Holy One. He is that is true. And then he is, this is said of him. And he that hath the key of David. Think about the word key. What is, what is a key usually used for? To lock. How about unlock, right? You know what I want you to be mindful of and consider this key of David. Why David of all the... All the, why not Moses? Why didn't he call it the key of Moses or the key of Peter even? Because that's what people think of Peter when they think of keys, huh? Exactly right, Steve. Nobody had a love for God's word like David. It was all about his attitude towards the word of God. You want God to open up your life and these opportunities spiritually? Man, have him change your perspective and your attitude towards his word. You know, think about history a little bit and, and, and God and how he worked and how he dealt in the Old Testament, right? There's different stages, if you will. There's the Exodus stage. There's the Judges. There's the Conquest stage with Joshua. Then the, we looked at the Judges stage on a Sunday morning a couple weeks ago. And then you get to First, Second Samuel, First, Second Kings, and that is known as the Kingdom stage, if you will. And there's two parts to the kingdom stage, the united and the chaotic kingdom stage, or not the chaotic stage, but the undivided kingdom, right? There's only three kings during the united kingdom stage, Saul, David, and Solomon. Only three kings from 1 Samuel to 1 Kings chapter 10 and 11. Saul, David, and Solomon. We know from the Bible that David... This very important king, King David, wasn't allowed or didn't have the privilege of building this house of God that he desired so desperately to build. He says, no, because David, you have blood on your hands. I'm going to let your son do this. But God never, ever forgot his love for this dude named David and the connection that he has to Christ. So over and over through the New Testament, you're going to see this reference to the throne of David, the key of David. And that key is the key in giving you access to this door. What did Jesus refer to himself in John chapter number 10, verse number 11? I am the what, he says? I am the door of the sheepfold. He's the door. And the key to that door, the key of David, the key is your attitude towards his word. Over and over in the Psalms, especially the 119th Psalm. The 119th Psalm is the largest chapter in all your Bible, 176 verses, and every single one of those verses mentions God's word. That was David's heart, David's attitude towards his word. So in spite of the fact that he did all this stupid stuff in his life, you know what? He never stopped loving and has had this incredible heart and attitude towards the word of God. I love certain verses in the 119. One of my favorite ones is Psalms 119, 165. Great peace, it says. Great peace have they who love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Are you easily, are you easily offended in this life? Are your feelings hurt for anything and everything? Maybe you don't love the word of God like you should, because if you really love you, his word, you're going to have great peace about who you are in Christ. Man, there's so much peace. There's so much perspective that God will give you when you're in love with his word. 
like this dude loved God's word. So it talks about this key of David. And look at how it's couched. He that openeth, I love this, and no man shutteth. And no man openeth. This is a God thing. There's a door that's going to be opened spiritually on planet Earth that nothing and no one can stop. The, evan, the evangelistic part of the church. This is also known as the missionary church where God took the gospel to the four corners. And man, what a period. What an amazing time. This is why it's referred to in the Bible as the Philadelphian church age, the brotherly love period. This, these people not only had a grasp and an understanding and a love for God and his word, but they knew what it mean, meant to love others. And this is why they gave of themselves. This is why they sold everything. And we're going to talk about some of these groups, these missionaries. They gave everything up. They were all in. They were sold out for God's glory because of their love for him and the love for the lost. What an amazing period. In seven, this verse seven, you, we, we see where Jesus is holding that key and a love for his word. Another interesting thing that, we are, that we're gonna consider are some of these factors leading to the decline of the dark ages. And again, ignore that portion in your notes because that's left over from last week inadvertently. <laughs> I just noticed that, all right? So let's look at verses eight through 10 now and consider this commendation that he gives these believers. There's some, okay, bear with me because we're gonna jump into some history stuff again, some really important and significant events and some things that were happening during this period. Look at verse number eight. You see Jesus saying these words, I know thy works, Philadelphians. Behold, I have set before thee, what? An open door. An open door and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength. And what's key about these guys? They did what? They kept his word. And I'm going to show you some things that happened during the Philadelphian church age where they kept his word. What an example to you and to me. You know what our issue is in Laodicea? We haven't kept his word. We say, we say we believe the Bible. We say the Bible is everything to us. But really, seriously, I'm not going to... No, don't raise your hands or anything. But after last Sunday, which was just three days ago, how many of you opened up your Bible between... No, don't raise your hand. You don't, don't you have to confess between Sunday and today. Right? How many of us? Or do we just put it back in the car, in the trunk, under the seat, wherever it is that we put it, and I'll pick it up next Sunday? These folks, man, they were all in. They were all in because they loved and they believed in God's word. Look at the next part of the verse. Thou hast a little strength, thou hast kept my word, and thou hast not, what, denied my name, man. They never lost sight and perspective of who Jesus Christ is. That is the one thing I'm trying to drive home with this church is never lose perspective and never lose grasp of who he is in your life. And because of that, man, don't let the thief rob you of your identity. I was meeting with a young man in the last couple of days who is experiencing that very issue. We start to feel hopeless sometimes in our lives, in our journey, in our, in our, in our life experience when we lose sight of who we are in Christ. Man, if you want to get lost, if you want to fall into a dark place really quick, Forget who you are in him. You are a child of the king. Imagine if we woke up each and every day grateful and, and blessed and thankful for, first and foremost, who you are in him. And then getting into his word so that you can hear from him. Because it's not just about you just coming to a place and just praying because you're in a crisis or things are going on in your life. But man, opening up his word so that he can speak to you. And let this conversation be a two-way conversation where you're intimate with him, when you're getting to know him. This is all about knowing him. And when you start to know him, you'll be able to, what's the next step in a, in a relationship if you know someone? Intimacy. You begin to trust. You begin to trust. And now you could apply verse number five and six from chapter three in Proverbs. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. 
Lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him and he'll what? He'll direct thy paths. You know what we don't do? We don't trust. Why can't we trust? You can't trust someone that you don't know. So the first step is really, really getting to know him. And if you want an awesome chapter or two chapters on knowing God, look at 1 John chapter number 4 and 5. 27 times the word know shows up. Know him, know him, know him. You know what David did? He knew the Lord, man. His heart was all in when it came to knowing God. And this is who these guys were. They knew him. They didn't deny him. Then this really verse, obscure, crazy verse shows up. This, by the way, is not a condemnation, but it's a reality of what happened in the Philadelphian church age. Look at this. Behold, I will make them, not the Philadelphian believers, but a group of people that are existing during this period. I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet. Wow. They will fall under your authority, Bible believers, Philadelphians, and to know that I have loved thee. He's going to remind these fake Jews who Christ is to them. The 10th verse, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world. So try them that dwell upon the earth. And although there were some crazy things that began to happen during this period historically, uh, this is what we would consider what historically is uh, the colonial period, if you will, where the Europeans began to colonize the planet during the Philadelphian church age. But during that colonial period process, there were solid God, lovers of God, lovers of his word that were embedded in these situations, missionaries that God took to win the world to Christ. Look at verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast that no man take thy crown. We'll talk about that whole thing. Let's talk real quick about verse 8. I want to just share with you some thoughts. <coughs> In verse 8, about the open door, if you want to go ahead and follow along in your notes, um, what happened at the beginning of this church period was the door began to be cracked open, right? We're leaving at this point, historically, the Thyatira period, which is the Dark Ages, which was a really, really wretched period. This is Rome. This is Papal Rome at its peak, with the Sardis period right after that showing up, with all this persecution going on with these popes. And again, keep in mind, because of the persecution and the corruption that was going on in Rome within the, the context of the papal church, um, God began to crack the door open a little bit. And you know how did he crack it? Guys, began, guys like John Whitcliffe began to show up on this scene. Anybody know who John Whitcliffe was? Very instrumental what? Bible translator. Um, Liz, Liz, how, how do I pronounce Liz's last name? Stinnard. Yeah, Liz, Liz Stinnard, who is in, uh, uh, I almost said Suriname, in, in, no, she's not in Cameroon, she's in um, Senegal. She's in Senegal right now, she's with Woodcliffe Bible Translators, and it's an organization that took this man's name, and because of what he began to provide, which this, has got, this guy laid the foundation for you and for me to have an English Bible to have a Bible in our language because during the, during the Thyatira and Sardis periods, the only folks that were allowed to read or taught to read were who? The aristocracy, the elites. Everybody else was kept there. You were a serf. You were to be kept dumb and stupid. You couldn't read. You're just a whatever, a laborer. <laughs> Do you not find it interesting that we're moving back to that kind of thinking again? Hmm. We use the term elites. They want to keep you dumbed down. They want to keep you stupid. I don't know when it was, two or three Bible studies ago, I said you have to become and you have to be a critical thinker. You have to question everything that is going on in this world because the Bible is driving home over and over that the day and age in which we find ourselves, deception is going to abound. 
And if you don't think deception is happening, you are pretty naive. You have buried your head in the sand. Be critical in your thinking. Be skeptical in how you perceive and view things that are happening on this planet, but never cross that line to being what? Cynical. Don't become a cynical. Then you're throwing your hands up and you're giving up. But my goodness, you ought to be asking a question and filter everything through his word. It's crazy where we find ourselves in our world today. So this guy came from a Waldensian background. Remember we talked about Waldensians? These were these Bible believers, man, that were just true to God's word throughout history. Another guy shows up in the Bible, John Huss. He was influenced by Woodcliffe, preached Christ. Followers were referred to as the Hussites. And these later, which, which were a Germanic people, became the Moravians. Um, they ended up in what is modern-day Czechoslovakia, a place called Moravia. Moravia is what it's referred to. And we'll talk about the Moravians here in a minute. You know, guess where the Moravians ended up? In the U.S. of A. And I'm going to share with you, during this period, really cool, awesome group of believers. John Huss was an interesting guy, Roman Catholic, who began to follow Whitecliffe. Well, most of the people back in the day were, were all Catholic guys, and that found God's word, and God's word revealed to them. And it was really cool because he really began to push the importance of getting the Bible in the hands of the common man. That was his big push. And guess what Rome did? In fact, I've seen the actual place on Lake Constance where they, um, what is it called when you torch somebody? Why am I going? Burned at the stake. Thank you. I almost, said, I almost said burned at the hamburger. Burned at the stake. <laughs> he was burned at the stake. And there's a huge, really cool monument. We were in Switzerland one year in northern Switzerland, and you drive by Lake Constance, and I saw, I wonder what that is, and I pulled over, and this is the place where John Huss was burned at the stake. So it was really cool, and I didn't even realize it until we just kind of pulled over and saw this thing. There's another tool that shows up, Erasmus of Rotterdam, a Catholic dude. Guy became a biblical scholar, and what's really cool about Erasmus was he was responsible for laying the foundation for what became known as the Greek text that our Bible comes from, the Textus Receptus. Really smart, incredible dude. And he, that, the Textus Receptus becomes the underlying text for the Bible that I use, and you're going to see briefly tonight as to why I use this Bible on me, share with you some thoughts when we get to some certain points. So the door begins to be cracked open with some of these key players right after the Sardis period and all this persecution is still happening. So it's kind of a transitional period. And then 1517 happens. Really significant event. We know this is the what? The Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation. How did the whole Reformation thing come about? Or another Roman Catholic priest begins to take pilgrimages to Rome and he begins to witness and observe all this craziness, debauchery and depravity and corruption. He says, man, what is going on? Goes back home to his city in a place called Wittenberg, Germany, nails the, the, what is known as this 99-point thesis on the actual door of the church, and he says, I'm done. We know that individual is none other than Martin Luther. And Martin Luther is the guy that spearheads. He's the tip of the spear when it comes to what we know today as the Protestant Reformation. What does the word Protestant mean or what's the root word in the word Protestant? Think about that for a second. Protest. Basically, he led a protest about everything that he witnessed and all the, all the corruption and depravity that was going on in Rome. And he begins to lead this effort known as the Reformation, the German Reformation. By the way, he found a verse as he got his hands on a German Bible, Die Heilige Schrift, which is still used today by the Amish of all places, of all peoples, in Pennsylvania and Ohio. And uh, in uh, Romans chapter 1, I believe it's verse 16, here's where he found the verse, the just shall live by faith. And that was a transforming verse for Martin Luther. And that really kicked that whole Reformation thing off. A guy by the name of um, John Calvin begins to show up, a French reformer, and you guys have heard us talk a lot about Calvin and John Calvin, and 
we know that he brought about some theology. Keep in mind, these are all reformers. These are Protestant reformers. A guy named Huldrych Zwingli shows up during this period, the Swiss Reformation. John Knox in 1513, 1572 brings about what is known as the Scottish Reformation. This is where, and this is the father of what we know today as Presbyterianism. Keep in mind John Calvin and a lot of people that follow Calvinist theology today. And you guys, guys, I think we talked about Calvinism briefly back in our Signs of the Times study. Do you guys remember that? I don't remember exactly the context of where we discussed it, but it's a very prevalent doctrine that's, that, that is very, very prevalent in the church today. Um, that being said, um, uh, again, keep in mind that this is Protestant theology. They, they're coming out of Rome. They continue to practice Roman theology. As a matter of fact, when you stop and you consider Calvinistic theology today, as it's being taught in a lot of churches and a lot of Baptist churches that have turned or have become Calvinistic in their theology, it's not a, it's not a denomination. Calvinism, it's not like there's a Calvinistic church. It's a philosophy that's been embraced by different denominations. Just be mindful of that. And they're all over the place. They're everywhere. Calvin, John Calvin, subscribed to the teachings of a guy named Augustine. You guys ever heard of an Augustinian monk, Sir Augustine? He's really the father of what we know today as modern-day Calvinism. Um, One of the big doctrines that you'll see in uh, the whole Protestant structure, and I want to make this clear. I was asked that today. We were were planning a a memorial service today at church, and um, as we were talking about I don't even know how it came up. It's a little bit of church history. We're talking about what we've been covering here on Wednesday nights. And um, I, I talked about how we do um, memorial services in an evangelical church versus a Catholic mass. And, and that was pretty cool because we were able to draw those distinctions. And um, the lady that was present in our meeting says, well, are, aren't we all Protestants? No. Those of us that adhere to the scriptures and as we've already seen some of these groups keep in mind all these folks that we're reading about guess when they showed up look at your notes when does the reformation kick off in 1517 what happened for the first 1500 years there were bible believers the waldensians the huguenots the bogomiles all those groups that we talked about in the last couple weeks and the previous weeks that's who we relate to that's who we connect with this is why we refer to ourselves, and I'm not, and I'm proud to refer to myself as a non-denominationalist. This is where denominations begin to form in the church age. So just because this is happening in the Reformation, all the stuff that was going on in the Reformation was not necessarily just a good thing because a lot of these guys stayed true to their doctrine. All they did was break away from the Roman Catholic Church. But you know what they began to do? They began to follow and stay true to Roman Catholic theology. Anybody been to a Lutheran service recently? Or maybe a Presbyterian one even? A lot of Catholic liturgy. If you go to, a, or an Anglican service, if you go to an Episcopal church, you're going to feel like you're part of a Catholic mass. They didn't let go a lot of that liturgy, right? Right? That's a huge distinction in terms of how we approach the word of God. What are we about? Preach the word. (laughs) Preach the word. Preach the word. That's all that matters. That's all that really cares. So there have been groups of people that have always stayed true to God's word throughout these last 2,000 years. And that's who I relate to and connect with. So that's why I'm I'm proud to refer to myself as non-denominational, Right? What's a denomination? What, think about the term denominator. What's the purpose in a fraction for the denominator? To what? To divide. Right? Divide, divide, divide. And I, I realize and I, I get the fact that there's denominations out there. One of the, one of the major doctrines that I struggle with, Larry, can you put, Larry, can you put up the, the, revelation, the revelation image up again? One of the things that I really struggle with, not that one, the other one, um, that I really struggle with is this truth right here. Here's what a Protestant or even a Roman Catholic theologian would believe and teach about 
the future. That and in here, embrace this, embrace this, this, this theme. It's called covenant theology. Here's what covenant theology. It came from Augustine. It came from Calvin. It's still taught by Calvinist churches. It's taught by a lot of groups today that embrace and refer to themselves as reformed. Right? Anybody know people that call themselves reformed? I do. You know what they're saying to you? That the church will bring about the kingdom. In other words, that's why they're buying into the world council of churches. This is why you'll see them being anti-Israel and pro-Palestine. And all these things that are happening, all these things that are playing out, they're embracing what is referred to as covenant theology that the church is going to bring about. Are you ready for this? The kingdom. Then when there's peace on earth and goodwill toward men, we're going to say, all right, Jesus, now you can come down and join us. Now you can come hang out with us. That's a post-millennial view of Scripture or an amillennial view of Scripture. We in our church, and I'm proud to call myself and refer to me, I hate that word proud, but we're dispensational in our beliefs. What, is that? what does that teach? This, that Jesus is going to bring about the kingdom. That's the purpose for his return. So those are the only two schools of thought when you think of eschatology in the future, especially as it relates to the kingdom. So either you're premillennial. What does premillennial imply? And we're going to talk more about this when we get there. That, the, that Jesus' is coming will happen before the what? Before the, no. no the second coming. The second coming. The, Jesus will come back before he sets up his kingdom. The purpose for his return is to establish his kingdom. Why they don't see that in the Bible is beyond me. Let me show you an interesting passage in the Bible just to kind of give you some context. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter number 9. Come look at this. Isaiah 9. Hey, Larry, could you throw the, the, the dispensational chart up real quick? Is everybody there? Look at uh, chapter number 9. <clears throat> look with me here in verse number, um, number 6. Look at, look, at these, uh, look at this really th- interesting thought real quick. Keep in mind that Isaiah is writing these words right around here on this timeline, right? This is when these prophets show up. Why do the prophets show up? Because Israel had turned their back on God. Sound familiar? If Israel will do it, don't you think the church will do it too? Yeah. It's doing it right now as we speak. Look around the planet today and look at how... how um, apostate the body of Christ is, right? I just talked to you about this professing quarterback who does one thing and says one thing and does another. It's late to see him, man. It's, it's lukewarm. It's pathetic Christianity. It annoys me. Anyway, check this out. This guy shows up right around here. And look what he says in this amazing prophecy about the coming of the Messiah. Verse number six. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Are you with me? Did that event happen? When? It happened here. At the first coming of Christ. Matthew chapter two. Right? The birth of Christ. Luke chapter one. Isaiah is prophesying about the coming of the Messiah as a child. How the Jews missed it in the New Testament and at the first coming, I'll, the first advent, I'll never get. Look at the next verse. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be on his what? On his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. What else is he going to be called? The what? Are you with me? The Mighty God. The Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Verse 7, of the increase of his government, what government? The millennial government, the millennium. And peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne, who look who shows up in this passage? David, on the throne of David. And, up, and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even for how long? Forever. Forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Here's what I find interesting about that verse. 
If you look at verse 6 again, show me where in history the government ended up on his shoulder, where he was called wonderful, counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. He wasn't, huh? He was murdered. He was killed. But guess when it's going to happen? Right here. The government will be on his shoulders. When he comes back, the world's going to see him in all his glory. Exactly like John described in Matthew chapter 1. Here's what I find interesting. You know what Isaiah did not see? This church period right here. This period right here known as the church. Why? That's right. That's it. That's it. That's exactly right. Because why? She's called a mystery. Thank you for that picture the other day, Daniel. That was so cool. It was so cool. Did anybody go to Danielle's wedding? That was, wasn't that awesome? Because I shared with them when we were together. You know, it's really sad that nobody, that brides don't wear veils anymore. And it was really cool. She wore a veil for her, for her, for her ceremony. And none of us could really figure out how incredibly beautiful she was until her groom, her Jesus. I'm sorry, I don't mean to call you that, Paul, Jesus, but her groom. You know what's so cool? He revealed to her, and then he kissed her, and then she looked at everybody, man, and she just glowed, right? She just looked so beautiful. That's the picture of this rapture thing that's going to happen. But here's what I'm here to tell you. The Jews didn't see this period. She was a mystery. That's why she's called a mystery in Ephesians chapter 5. I want to show you a great mystery the relationship between Christ and his church. Jews are still waiting for a Messiah. You know what's sad? They're going to get a fake Messiah, counterfeit. Wait till we get to Revelation chapter 6, the white horse rider. I'm going to show you an interesting video of this American rabbi who lives in Jerusalem today who talks about the, third, the, the rebuilding of the third temple. He says it needs to be built We need to have that in order for our Messiah to return. You know what's so sad? They missed him 2,000 years ago. Had they received him as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, had they received him as the Messiah, he would have established his kingdom. This thing would have happened back in here, before before the cross. Actually, he gave them three chances, right? You know what the first chance was? Strike one, three strikes? John the Baptist Repent, be baptized for the what? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom's here. The king is here. And what do they do to John? So Jesus says, all right, my buddy John, this prophet, by the way, John's going to show up again prophetically, right? Wait till we get to Revelation chapter number 11. Huh? Prophetically. God's not done with these guys. So strike number two. Matthew chapter number 12. Jesus says, all right, man, I'm here. Here's my kingdom. No, you're not. You're not the king. You are the Lord of the flies, Beelzebub. Who said that to him? The leaders of Israel, the scribes, the Pharisees. And from chapter 13 on, he begins to preach or he begins to speak in how? Or he begins to teach in what? Parables. For what purpose? To hide the kingdom to hide the kingdom from these, these kingdom rejectors. So that's strike number two. So they crucify him. They end up crucifying the king. They even mock him by putting a crown on him and putting, according to the gospel of Luke, a sign over his cross that said, the what? Here lies the what? The king of the Jews. They never forgot who he was. They knew who he was. The Romans did that. And then... 40 days later, or thir- three days, you have the, the, the death, burial, the resurrection. Jesus resurrects on the third day, and he sticks around planet Earth for another 40 days. And in the book of Acts chapter 1, as he's revealing to them all these spiritual things, when you get to the sixth verse, the disciples who are present, 11 of them, because Judas had already hung himself, they're asking one question, all right, when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? That's all, we're Jews, man. That's all we know. And what's his reply? It's not, for you to know. it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. You know what? Just be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost. And that's exactly what begins to happen. So you get to Acts chapter number 7. 
Strike number three, this dude named Stephen shows up, one of the disciples, and he's preaching away, man, about who Jesus was. He takes them all the way back to the Old Testament. Who's they? The religious Jews of the day in Jerusalem. And what did they do to Stephen? They stoned him. They killed him. And Jesus says, all right, I'm done. And in the very next chapter, Philip is up in Samaria, have Jews, have Gentiles, preaching no longer the gospel of the kingdom. Now he's preaching the gospel of grace. And then God moves him to Gaza where he meets up with the Ethiopian eunuch. And now you're starting to see people that are non-Jews coming to Christ just like you and I did. Are you with me? And the church is born. This mystery for the next 2,000 years. That's what we've been talking about since a month ago or two months ago. But Isaiah didn't see this. Why? I'm looking at Danielle because she's a mystery. She's a mystery. But guess what? We just saw the promise. We saw the prophecy. Look at it again. His name should be called Wonderful. They didn't call him Wonderful. They called him Beelzebub. They didn't call him Counselor. They didn't even call him the Mighty God. The Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. We know what they did to Jesus. This is what Isaiah sees. And here's the point. Because these are Jews, and they're looking at things. This is how you rightly divide the word of truth. They don't see the church. They don't see this valley. All they see is Israel and the whole story. Now, as you look at this timeline, this green line, this is where God restores Israel from 2,000 years of diaspora. So after that whole Stephen thing in Acts chapter 7 where they kill the dude, guess what happens next? If you want a really cool, really good, you guys like history reads? Read the book, The War of the Jews by Josephus, by Flavius Josephus. And you'll see what was going on in Jerusalem and in that part of Israel as God began to take the gospel into Turkey, Asia Minor, Greece, and ultimately the rest of Europe. They're getting massacred. The Romans are destroying them. In in 70 AD, the temple is destroyed and the Jews are scattered to the four winds. Until when? Until 1917 and then later 1948. And now they're in the land again. Did you know that the term Israel was on no map, on any map, for the last 2,000 years until 1948? I'm sure that's just a coincidence, right? See how real and how true the word of God is? He's preparing the world for his return, right? This whole tribulation period, Larry, could you throw that up one more time, the, big, the bigger t- revelation chart? This period in the middle that we keep looking at, this is Israel's judgment and God's opportunity to bring the Jews back to him. That's the purpose. In the meantime, where are you? In the meantime, where's the church? Where's the believer? Up here in this red box. Dealing with the whole other thing, three major events. We're going to talk in some detail. I'm going to mention it briefly tonight. We're going to talk about the judgment seat of Christ and what that means and its significance in our lives because it's implied in our text tonight. Then we're also going to look at another event. You know what? After the, as soon as we go through this judgment seat of Christ where we give an account for what we did with this one life that God blessed you with and gave you, he's going to invite us over to the banisters of heaven. Come join me and let's look down on what's going to happen on planet earth for the next seven years. That's this event right here. The seven sealed books revealed. You and I get to witness all that's going to happen. When he's done, we're going to go through this purification process, this cleansing process, and he's going to prepare us for this event right here, the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's the whole thing. That's what we witnessed when Paul and Danielle got married the other day. That's what every, every single marriage represents is. That is the celebration of that event of Christ marrying his bride. And then we're done. We load up. I'm going to get my Shetland pony. I'm going to follow Kristen along the way. 
and we're going to make our way back with him at the second coming of Christ. For what purpose? So that he could establish his kingdom. We are premillennialists. We're pre-trib rapture. We're premillennial second coming. Are you with me? That's our position. This is in our doctrinal statement. This is in our statement of beliefs. Not everybody believes in things like this. Right? You guys remember the days? You remember? Remember? <laughs> Growing up at Sunny Cedar Church, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will what? I mean, nobody ever really taught me what that come again thing meant. Uh, that didn't get figured out until God gave me his word. There's two parts to his coming. First Thessalonians 4, rapture. First Thessalonians 5, second coming. It's all over the scriptures. How these covenant theologians don't get it, I don't know. I don't know. It's not complicated. Rightly dividing the word of truth. All right? The millennium for a thousand years. We'll see that when we get to Revelation chapter 20. We'll unpack that stuff. We're going to take you back into the Old Testament and show you some of the things that will be happening during that kingdom. So all this stuff is happening. The Reformation happens. Martin Luther, John Calvin, Heidrich Zwingli, John Knox, the Scottish Reformation. Anybody have ever hear of Jacobus Arminius, the, Ju- the Dutch Reformation? He was four years old when Calvin died. Any Armenians in here? Not Armenians as in Armenia, but Armen- Jacobus Arminius. There's a doctrine out there. In fact, it's still... Um, it's still prevalent today. We'll talk about where and how it reveals this. But you're, the opposite theological worldview is Arminianism versus Calvinism, right? And uh, we're not going to get into all the theological stuff, but this guy becomes a major player during that period. Anybody here familiar with the English Reformation and how that whole thing played out? It's an interesting story. Back in, um, during the reign of uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth I and her son, uh, Henry VIII, King Henry VIII, um, it was going back and forth between whether or not um, England was going to become Roman Catholic or it was going to be some kind of Protestant faith. King Henry VIII, who was known for having a bunch of wives, right? He was that kind of a dude, uh, was, being, um, was being mandated um, that he was going to have to take a Roman Catholic queen as wife so that the church, the Roman church, could keep all the monarchies connected with each other. You're going to marry, um, um, what's her name? Catherine. Catherine of Aragon. That's who you're going to marry, King Henry. And he says, you're not going to tell me who to marry. I'm the king of England. So he says, I like this other hot chick in my life. Her name is <laughs> Anne Boleyn. So he basically thumbs his nose at Rome and he ends up marrying Anne Boleyn. Um, unfortunately, she did not have or wasn't able to give him an heir. All she was able to do, she had a bunch of miscarriages and she ends up um, having a daughter and that wasn't going to cut it in terms of having or wanting a male heir. So he dumps Anne Boleyn and begins to do his own thing. But during that whole process, and the reason why it's called the English Reformation is because at this point, when he thumbed his nose at Rome, he started his own religion or his own denomination. We know it today as the what? The Anglican Church. So when you see that dude with the big ears that calls himself the King of England, (laughs) Charles I, (laughs) right? He's a descendant and the throne, which is still the British monarchy, we know that his mom just died, right? Um, that's part of the legacy of the whole English monarchy. And this is why the throne or the English monarchy oversees what we know today as the Anglican church. What's really interesting, this dude, and he probably couldn't wait for his mom to die, right away he jumped in bed, not literally, but, but symbolically, with the pope. So right now today they're starting to connect like never before because again we'll talk about we'll talk about it next week when we start looking at the legacy in church and a significant event that happened in in um, 1960 that is really really key to bring us where we're at today. 
That being said, Henry VIII thumbs his nose at Rome and he does his own thing with Anne Boleyn. He says, you know what? I'm going to start my own religion. And he does. It's called the Church of England or the Anglican Church. We know it as in America as what? The Episcopal Church. So St. Bede's over here on San Mateo. Uh, what's the name of the church over on Palace and uh, Paseo de Peralta? City of Faith? No, not City of Faith. That's over on North Rodeo. Old, not Old Faith. Holy Faith. Holy Faith. Holy Faith Episcopal Church. If you look really close at some of their symbology in their, in their branding, you'll see the English flag. Why do you see the English flag? Not the Union Jack, but the English flag. That's because it's the English church. And their major or their primary authority is not the Pope, although it's becoming the Pope, but more so the Archbishop of Canterbury. And all this, all this um, stuff that we witnessed in the last several weeks as they were handing um, the reins over to, to Charles um, is all part of the uh, pomp and circumstance that makes up the British throne, which is the English or the Anglican Church. Up north, just north of England, the northern part of England, as a matter of fact, you know, I had the privilege of visiting John Wesley's original church up in a place called Keithley, England, when we were up there visiting. Um, you find this Anglican, this Anglican guy um, who is caught up in the liturgy, and all of a sudden he gets a hold of his, a Bible or his Bible, and he begins to see the importance of evangelizing. And John Wesley begins to... Uh, drive home the importance of coming up with some Methodists, some methods to do a better job evangelizing and not just have religious services for the sake of religious services. Hence the Methodists. And one of the cool things that happens in John Wesley's life as he's making his way to Savannah, Georgia, as America begins to open up, is he finds himself on a slave ship that he just bought a fare to get over to the New World. And um, it happened to be a bunch of Moravians, these German Bible believers that were on the ship with him. And the Moravians jumped on this boat so that they could win the slaves to Christ. That was their motive. They were all about winning people to Jesus, these Moravian Germans. They were incredible. And um, on their way to the New World... Um, it was really interesting because um, a storm kicks in and man, everything gets really chaotic and really crazy and he begins to freak out and um, the Moravians are singing praises to the Lord in the midst of chaos. And at the end of the journey, he says to the Lord, I want in my heart the peace that these guys have. And John Wesley begins to bring about this revival movement within the Anglican Church. And I think we're familiar with some of the Methodist stuff that is even happening today, like it, what happened in Ashbury, uh, Tennessee, and some of those. Those are Methodist churches that fell in line with some of this more uh, very spiritual effect that John Wesley was able to bring about in this life. So you begin, you begin, you begin to see God doing some amazing things in, in uh, the history of some of these events or some of these key individuals. Look with me in verse 10. In verse 10, you find where some of these guys were able to keep the word of God because thou hast kept the word, it says, of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. That should be a principle for you and for me. Keep God's word in your heart. And he's going to give you the peace that is going to be so profound in the midst of storms as things begin. And mark my words, as things begin to get more and more chaotic, they're going to happen. Be aware of that. Be mindful of that. I'm warning you, things are going to get really crazy, crazy, crazy in the coming weeks and months, I believe, as we get closer to that event. Uh, so that being said, these guys kept the word, the preservation and publication of God's word becomes really, really key and very prevalent. You want to hear a really crazy thing? The Gutenberg Press is invented in 1540. The press. You know how they were doing, making copies of God's word before the Gutenberg Press? Scribes by hand. So if all he wanted a Bible, if all he said, Pastor John, could I have your Bible? 
back in the day, I would have had to copy the Bible word for word and say, here's your copy of the Bible. Now I could just get online. It's on my computer. <laughs> it's crazy where we're at today, huh? The press shows up, and the very first thing to come off the Gutenberg press, Germans again, right? It was what? The word of God, the Bible. These are the people that kept their word. They kept the word of God. Man, the Bible becomes key and significant throughout the history of the Philadelphian church age. It becomes the heart of everything that they're about. It's all about the word of God. It's all about God's word. As a matter of fact, I'm not going to get into it, but there's seven distinct English translations that show up during the Philadelphian church age, beginning with Whitecliffe's translation and all the way to seven. Here's what's really cool. Look with me in... Um, Larry, could you bring up, um, I think it's verse number six of Psalms chapter 12. Psalms 12, six. I want you guys to see this verse. This is a really fascinating verse. I believe in what is called the doctrine of preservation. Right? We often quote in our church, I quote it all the time, that all scripture is given by what? Inspiration, Inspiration of God. And what does that imply? That it's God breathed. You either believe that your Bible, the Bible you hold in your hand, is inspired of God, or, or it's not. It's just someone, some, just another translation. I don't believe that about my Bible. I believe that it's inspired God's word, and he, the way he inspired, and the way he kept inspiration was through preservation. And what's really interesting, during the Philadelphian church age, there's seven distinct English versions that show up, the first one being Wycliffe taking his... Greek text from the Textus Receptus coming up with his version or his translation and then there's seven more. Um, they're handwritten in my study Bible which I happen to leave at home or I would give them to you tonight. But I'll give them to you next week. But look at this verse. The words of the Lord are what? Pure words. The words of the Lord are what? Pure words. As silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified Seven times. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that an awesome verse? God purified his word seven times. You know what the seventh English version is? Or look, at your, look at your little chart thing again. What's the number seven? The number of perfection. Anybody know what the seventh English translation was? 1611. Exactly. Good job, Nancy. How did you know that? Get up here and teach. Good for you. That's evident. So you began to see some really things happening, profound things. By the way, that was the only English Bible during the Philadelphian church age. There were no other translations. We're going to talk about what began to happen at the end of the age, at the end of the Philadelphian age, with two guys that show up on this scene. During this period you find the founding of the United States of America. Begins with the, Pil the Plymouth Colony and the Puritans, the Mayflower Compact, and um, their desire to seek freedom from these state-run religions in Europe. That was the whole purpose. A really cool read, a really good book. It's in my library. I would re highly recommend it. But the history of our great country as it relates to God's word is what hath God wrought. Highly recommend that book if you want to understand our connections to the word of God during the Philadelphian church age as a country. We were founded when or when did we declare our independence? Yeah. Isn't it interesting they're trying to change that now? The 4th of July, they're trying to change it to what? Juneteenth. Let's just keep changing our history, right? Let's just keep knocking down statues. Let's keep doing what we're doing. I'm telling you, man, we're losing it. Keep forgetting your history, man. There will be a consequence to that whole thing. Two major, although there were seven great awakenings, the two significant ones were in America, and they began to launch the great missionary movements of the day. The first great awakening was between 1720 and 1750. George, guys like George Whitfield, David Brainerd, Jonathan Edwards, his infamous, his infamous, infamous sermon 
Oh, sinners in the hands of an angry God, man, just transformed the world. Between 1720 and 1850, there was another second great awakening. This is where you hear of guys like Charles Spurgeon, an English preacher, making his way to Boston and preaching there. Anybody hear of D.L. Moody, the great evangelist from Chicago? All these great, great um, Bible preachers. I'm not talking theologians. These were guys that st stood true on God's word and just preached it, man. They just brought it. Just like Paul told Timothy, man. In the last days, there's going to be perilous times. He says, when you get there, he says, just preach the word. Just preach the word. Just preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. And that's what they did. There's a missions explosion. Just to name a few, here's a little list in your notes. William Carey becomes the father of modern-day missions, and he ends up in India. He spent 45 years in India and never went back home. You know what this guy's job was before he became this very significant and very profound missionary? He was a shoe cobbler. He fixed shoes. God don't care about your background, man. He doesn't. He's not looking for what you know or don't know. Do you have a willing heart? And that was William Carey. The Moravians, I've just talked about the Moravians, right? The Moravians were an amazing, amazing group of people. If you've heard of places like Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, uh, locations like that, New Philadelphia, Ohio, these were Moravian colonies. These were German people that settled in the Americas that had a true and a profound impact on our country and its biblical history. Um, Adonai and Judson ended up in Burma. Burma, David Livingstone, in what is Malawi today, started um, winning people to Christ in, in, in Africa. Hudson Taylor in China, Amy Carmichael in India, C.T. Studd in China. Three-fourths, 75% of the planet during the Philadelphia Church Age, are you ready for this? New Christ as Savior. Isn't that crazy? I wonder what the percentage is today. Laodicea. Laodicea. Right? What a, what a contrast. These Philadelphians versus us Laodiceans. Let me share with you some of the significant outcomes from the um, Philadelphian church age that happened culturally and even sociologically. Did I say that right, Daniel? Sociologically? <laughs> Um, bear with me. Listen to this. This is really cool. The years following 1700 also witnessed the rapid rise of invention. James Watt invented the steam engine. Benjamin Franklin was born. Newtonian physics revolutionized science. The newspaper business exploded in the information revolution. Still, the post-Reformation state churches of Europe all took the view that they would remain the holders of great political and financial power. Isn't that interesting? Who are those state churches? Not just the Roman church, but the Lutheran church. The, Pres the Presbyterians up in Scotland, church state stuff. I'm going to be straight with you. I'm a strong believer in the separation of church and state. Leave us the stinking alone, yeah. right? Yes. I get concerned sometimes about some of these Christian nationalists that are in our midst, politicians. I say if you're going to be a believer politician, man, Go in there, man, and win people to Christ. You're not going to change the world. I keep saying this. You're not going to change the culture from the outside in. That's called social justice, the social justice gospel. That's a Calvinist doctrine, by the way. You want to change the world, you got to change a soul at a time, a heart at a time. I'm not talking, you don't need to be protesting. You need to be witnessing. There's a huge difference. We have it all backwards in the late sin church age. You know what's happening in our country, and it's being more and more divided. People are literally packing up and moving to places with conservative politicians or conservative governments. A lot of those on the right are moving to Florida because of DeSantis. Well, what happens if they get a liberal governor? Are you going to move out of there? No, man, be a light wherever God has you. I love living in this liberal, crazy town called Santa Fe. We are in the belly of the beast, man. What more could you ask for? We're exactly where these early believers were during this period. Adonai Judson going to 
China and Livingstone going to places like Africa, atomistic Africa, mind you. David Brainer going to the Native Americans dies at 27 years old from a cold in Kufa. He's sleeping in a tent in the, in, the, in, the, in the heart of winter. By the way, Yale University has an entire dorm or hall named after him. And look where Yale's at today. Look where Harvard's at today. Brown, look where Brown's at today. You know what all these schools were at one point? They were colleges to train missionaries. Tell me there's a revival going on in this country. It's Laodicea. That's our reality. Look at this. Some more thoughts. The holders of great political and financial power, they were aligned with kings whose monarchies were considered divinely ordained. And so the divine right of kings characterized church power, which considered the ruling class to be naturally superior to the impoverished serf. But something changed during the Philadelphian church age, where once only the priests of state churches could read the Bible, the repressed masses of the world now eagerly began to learn scripture. Do you know what was used in our one-room schoolhouses at the beginning of our nation's founding to teach kids how to read? This Bible right here. This is what they learned, how they learned to read. Isn't that cool? For all you little House in the Prairie fans. Right, Larry Romero? I can't tell you how many episodes I've seen of Little House on the Prairie. I said, we just saw that last week. What are we doing watching this again? Well, Laura did this or whatever. Watch this. The pilgrims. The pilgrims of the new world linked the words of the Bible and freedom in Christ with the ownership of private property and representative government. With the U.S. Declaration of Independence in 70s, the power of the state was broken. Not anymore, huh? Look at our government today. You think the government's about you? No, it's about special interests. It's about lobbyists. It's about who's got the money to pay them off. And they're all bought. They're all bought. Both sides... There are two wings of the same bird. That's who they are. Don't get me wrong. There are some guys that are out. There are exceptions. Some, some, I believe, godly men. Some men of principle. Some men of morals that are still senators and congressmen. But as a whole, they're all, we're done. We are so done. And through the Industrial Revolution, global travel and the rise of modern economies, the light of the gospel blazed forth. Halfway through the 19th century, an enormous change took place when in England and America, independent Bible studies began to predict Israel's return to the Holy Land. That's a dispensational believer in theology, not a covenant theology guy. At the same time, the great missionary movements began to spin the globe with the message of the gospel. As the year 1900 approached, the great missionary movements came to their full potential and the modern church was born. And guess who that modern church is? Laodicea. Next week, we're going to entry to Laodicea. Although there was this amazing open door and people that kept the word of God, the devil is always at work, right? And there's always, and there were historically, and it's in your notes, there were intruders that came about during and through this open door. As the Reformation began to kick in heavily, the Roman church began to move to counter the Reformation. That was the purpose for the Council of Trent, was to start establishing systems to counter this movement Um, against these um, Protestant reformers. In 1540, the Jesuits are born. Anybody know anything about the Jesuits? It's a Roman Catholic order whose sole purpose is to um, keep Rome in power. They're known as Rome's or the Pope's Marines. They're very militant. They're very intelligent. And they have totally... Um, infiltrated our security apparatus in this country. They're all over the CIA, all over the FBI. So all this craziness that is happening and playing out 
Guess who's behind it? It's these guys right here. And guess who is, guess who's training them up and sending them out? Right across the Potomac River is this big university known as Georgetown, a Jesuit school. So they all get their degrees from there. They all get trained. And then they make their way into the government and do what they want to do. And that's where we find ourselves. And this guy, Ignatius Loyola, became, becomes the general of the Jesuits. And they're still very active. They will continue to be active until this country ultimately is destroyed because that is their agenda. I could spend an entire evening just talking about the Jesuits and their role throughout history in bringing about revolution. If you guys remember back in the late 70s and early 80s in Latin America when you saw these right-wing um, dictatorships and the countering of those by the more uh, poorer classes and this whole concept of liberation theology. You know who was behind liberation theology? The Jesuits, right? And they're behind the whole social justice movement today. So that's a lot of their role. Uh, that's a lot of what they're about. Even when England was moving towards their independence from Rome in the early part of the 16th century in 1504, for example, in 1604 and then 1605, they had a huge role. When James I in, 16, in, in uh, 1604 authorized the, the printing of this particular Bible, authorized its printing or its publishing, actually not printing but publishing, um, the Jesuits that were very prevalent in England at the time began to move towards them against them. And I would encourage you to read up on an event that happened in 1605 known as the Gunpowder Plot. When it's in your notes, get online and just do a little bit of research. It's a fascinating event. Uh, it was led by, by, I believe, like nine Jesuits um, that were being funded and supported by Rome uh, to overthrow and to kill King James, who happened to show up at the first parliamentary session. And the plan was to blow up all of Parliament um, in 1605. Uh, one of the key guys, the guy responsible for actually putting the the barrels of dynamite and lightning, the fuses, was well, the name of Guido Fox, or he's also known as Guy Fox. Let me just show you a little image of him. It's an image I know that is very that you're very familiar with, very prevalent, even in our culture today. I'm just going to Google his image. Check this out. And he represents... Um, he represents um, revolution... Or, or anarchy, right? I know you're familiar with this guy, this image. Uh, you, you could even buy his mask if you want one. You guys familiar with that image? That's Guido Fox. So when you see these kids downtown, when they're bringing down the the, obl the ob obelisk down on the plaza and they're wearing their masks and they're doing all this other stuff, they're saying, man, I'm embracing what this guy tried to do to the English parliament, the English government back in 1605. Ezra. He actually looked like that? No, he looked like that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. No, the mask is, this, the actual mask, the ask, and as a matter of fact, there's a dude, there's a dude called Anonymous that wears this mask. Have you heard of him? Yeah, and he's kind of very conspiratorial in some of the th things that he is. But this was Guido Mas. This was Guido or, or Guy Fox, who was one of the main conspirators in attempting to blow up the parliament. He's still pretty prevalent in our culture today, isn't he? Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Exactly. They're all about. Um, they're all about um, anarchy. These guys were all about anarchy. And um, I don't have to tell you who's behind, the, who's behind causing the disturbances and all the, under the guise of social justice, right? Call it Antifa, call it Black Lives Matter, call it whatever you want to call it. We know who's behind it. It's these guys. Yeah. Soros, from a funding standpoint, but from a, you, you still need soldiers on the ground to instigate, to stir. And those are our buddies. And they're brilliant, man. That's why they've started universities all over the planet. 
The highest concentration of Jesuits anywhere in the world is not Rome. It's Boston. So Boston College. All the Loyola universities. Gonzaga up in, um, up in uh, Washington. Uh, you can just rattle them off, man. They're everywhere. They're every, like, the, like you deadheads, grateful dead people, they're everywhere. So that's who they are. They're a fascinating group. You should study them, man. They're, they're uh, an incredible bunch of dudes. During this time, the Jesuits begin to play a role. They instigate what is known as the 30 Years' War. They're behind the, the start of the war, which is nothing more than this 30-year war in Germany and in Holland between Protestant and Catholic uh, religions, frankly. And uh, that goes on and on to destroy Europe. Um, Europe went from in Germany from uh, 16 million people to 6 million people as an, as the, from the outcome from that war. And then in the um, late 19th, the late 20th century, 1825 to 19, 1903, two guys began to show up on the scene. Two guys named Westcott and Hort, Jesuits, by the way, who um, introduced a new Greek text from the Jerome Latin Vulgate and began what we know today as the new translations. They came out with the WH edition of the Bible, which is the Westcott and Hort edition, which begins to be the foundation text or manuscript for all what I would refer to, not all, but most of the new translations today. Westcott and Hort. Check those dudes out. Fascinating two dudes. Again, that begins to happen historically. While all this stuff is happening with the Jesuits and all this counter-reformation stuff, now, the devil is hard at work, and look at verse number nine. This is a fascinating verse. Man, it's already nine o'clock, folks. Um, look at verse nine. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, who would say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Also, during the Philadelphian church age, in a very strategic, very incredible move that the devil makes, is he also begins to counterfeit um, um, the, the church with cults. This is where and, and where the Mormonism is founded in 1830. Joseph Smith, um, later making his way into Missouri, just Independence, Missouri, if you know where that's at, it's a suburb of Kansas City. That's where they first ended up, the LDS um, and then a group of them led by Brigham Young, he took them to Salt Lake City, Utah. A bunch of them stayed behind. They're known as the RLDS, the Reorganized Church of Latter-day Saints. And we know the um, modern-day uh, LDS people known or referred to themselves as the Mormons. Um, again, replacing the Word of God with their own text, the Book of Mormon, the... Uh, Doctrines and Covenants, the Pearls of Great Price. This Joseph Smith guy begins to introduce all kinds of new texts to that religion. So the cults began to play a, a role. And what's one of the big Mormon moves is this whole idea of replacement theology. That, hey man, here we are, right smack at the end of the at the end of the 19th century, and Israel is still scattered to the four winds, so we must be the new Jews. We must be the new Israel, the, the new Israelis. The Seventh Day Adventists begin to show up. We know about the Seventh Day Adventists and William Miller and Ellen G. White, who was this prophet lady who would. That's why, if any of you have ever been to a a um, a um, Seventh Day Adventist uh, conference or whatever, and they'll show up here. They remember when they used to show up at the Chavez Center and they had their little conference. They're very prophetic. They're very prophecy focused. So a lot of it came because of Ellen G. White. So you see the Seventh-day Adventists show up in 73. The Je Jehovah's Witnesses in 1873, Charles Taze Russell. Again, this belief that they replaced Israel. They're the new 144,000. When they exceeded the amount, they said, well, maybe not so. And all this stuff. Unitarianism shows up from Kansas City, Lee Summit, Missouri. Uh, Scientology, the New Age. And man, things just get crazier and crazier. Why? If you can't beat them, join them. And the cults begin to show up. And that's what begins to happen in people's eyes. 
The charge of the Philadelphians, verses 11 through 13. I'm just going to read these verses, man, because we're pretty much done. But there is some cool stuff in here that we'll cover maybe next week. If not, we'll cover it for sure when we get to chapter 4. This is how the letter closes to this church. Behold, I come quickly. There's the promise, right? Jesus reminding them, I'm coming, man. I'm coming. Behold, I come quickly. Um, Hold fast to that which thou hast. In other words, hold fast to the word of God. You have it. Then no man take thy crown. Don't let them rob you of your rewards. Right? We know what those are. At this, there's five crowns that are gifted to the believer in the church age. Um, The crown that I believe the Spirit of God is referring to is known as the crown of rejoicing, found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 17 to 20, which is known as the soul winner's crown. This is the evangelistic church, right? Verse 12, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from God. There's the promise and I will write upon him my new name. That was the strength and the significance of these Philadelphia believers. Verse 13, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Philadelphian believers, what an incredible history. What a period, huh? All right, so bear with me, hang with me. Next week we're going to look at the last church which is the one that we're living in today. And you will be pretty blown away with its characteristics and some of the things. Uh, It's 9.03. I'll give you two minutes. Does anybody have a question? If Elizabeth has a mic. It's actually two, but Mm -hmm. in verse 10, when he talks about keeping us... Uh, say for keeping us aw- uh, away mm-hmm. is that making a reference to the rapture um let's look is at it, it says he's going to keep us from that time let's look at that tiger real quick because thou has kept the word of my of my patience i will also keep thee from the hour of temptation the hour of temptation yeah the hour of temptation and this is a, again one of those promises that you find in each one of these churches that you won't be going through the trip Philadelphia church. That's what that is, yeah, though, is a reference exactly. to that. Yeah. Okay, so then in the tribulation, I mean, sorry, in the rapture, mm-hmm. it says that, well, like the thief that died on the cross, he was going to be with Jesus in paradise that day. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, Paul says to, to be out of this body is to be with Jesus. Yeah. Why do the dead have to rise first if everyone's already there? Here's what we can't lose sight of, and I wish we would have had some time because we'll definitely cover it. But Second, second uh, uh, Corinthians chapter 5 reveals to that. When we die, um, what is resurrected is not the body, but the spirit, right? The soul. To be absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. So your body is going to be buried, but one of these days you're going to get a glorified body. So what you see happening, and, and you make a really good reference, a really profound reference to the thief on the cross um, because he goes to this place called paradise. Paradise in the context of what's playing out is not heaven. It's not the third heaven where the Lord reigns, but this other place, are you ready for this? Something really weird and crazy? And I'm going sh- I'm gonna, to I'm gonna lay this out and it's called the doctrine of, the, of hell, if you will, or the, or the inner earth. Um, it was, there was a place called um, Paradise or Abraham's Bosom where the Old Testament saints ended up when they died. David, Solomon, um, all those Old Testament prophets, when they passed away, they went to a place called Abraham's Bosom. When the thief on the cross dies, the resurrection hadn't happened, right? So he had to go somewhere. There's no such thing. As a matter of fact... If you look at that passage, this is where the Roman church gets the whole concept of purgatory from. It's not purgatory. And then you pray these dudes out. No. It was a temporal place for the Old Testament saints that were ultimately resurrected when Jesus resurrected. In other words, that guy was only in there for a couple days. 
right? He dies. He goes to Abraham's bosom. Jesus resurrects. And guess what? He too is bodily resurrected. You want to see a really weird verse, crazy verse? Look at Matthew 27. This is immediately after the resurrection. And I don't know if you guys have ever seen this passage, but it's really fascinating. To me, it is anyway. Um, Matthew 27, it's in the, it's in the, it's in the fifties here. Uh, look at verse number 50. And Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, right? This is a very Jewish dispensation, if you will. Right, Tagger? These things are still happening. They're still playing out. Um, from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks did rend. Look at verse 52. This is really crazy. Look at verse 52. And the graves were opened, and many of the bodies of the saints which slept arose. <laughs> Talk about the night of the living dead. What's that show on Sunday nights? Walking the Walking Dead. <laughs> Look at verse 53. And they came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Who are those saints? Those Old Testament saints, all those Hebrew Jewish dudes and dudettes. And they saw him. So when Jesus resurrects, when he ascends, they're with him. Now they're in the third heaven. Abraham's bosom today is empty. Ephesians 4, remember, he led captivity captive. That was part of his plan when he descended into the lower earth to bring those Saints in paradise, Abraham's bosom liberates them. And this is the actual event where it actually happens. Then who are the dead that rise in, in at, Christ? at the rapture? Um, all these guys that we just read about, Jed and I Hudson, David Brainer, all these folks that have died, they're, remember we talked about that, I think in chapter number four, they're in a sleep state right now. Their bodies, they're, they're dead, right? Not their spirit. Not their, their soul. Right. Exactly. It's not a Jehovah Witness doctrine, which is the whole soul sleep thing. No. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So what was resurrected immediately after you were saved? You're seated in a heavenly place today, right? Spiritually speaking. So the day that you die, the day that we die, your body will go in there till the rapture. But keep in mind what we can't lose sight of is this whole idea of now you're living in this spiritual realm and it's almost like instantaneous. So these guys that were living in the 19th century, it's but a blip from a spiritual perspective, right? Right. A day with the Lord is a thousand years. A thousand years is, a, is one day. So if we really break down those time elements, 150 years ago, 200 years ago, when all this filled up in church serious stuff was happening, is but a but a blip from a spiritual perspective. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the dead in Christ will rise first. Who are the dead in Christ? All these folks that have died in F Ephesian period, Smyrna, Pergamus, um, Thyatira, Sardis, the only ones that were, are going to be alive and at his coming, at his rapture, are the, those believers that are present in the latency in church. We're going to talk about that next week. Yeah, Michelle? Did that answer your question, Tiger, a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Look, check out 2 Corinthians 5, verses 8 through 14. So, Pastor, his, um, just to talk about uh, verse number 10, mm -hmm. um, is, is he pretty much speaking of two groups of people, those that have been saved through the rapture and those that will remain during the tribulation? Um, no, keep of it. Of the last sentence yeah. on that, that verse? It says, from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. So look at, look at the verse again. So Let's they unpack dwell it. upon the earth? Yeah. When there's all that temptation that's going to affect the world, it's going to be the, tri <coughs> the tribulation period, right? So they're kept... From that period, who's they? 
this, Those that have been... this, yeah, this particular, historically, this particular group, the Philadelphian believers within this context, just a reminder, always God is reminding us that we're secure from that event. How many of you have been around people that believe that the church is going to go through the trip, right? Mm-hmm. Right? To this day. I, I just wondered because it says to try, so it's clear to me the, the first yeah, sentence it, that Again, that look at your comment. Saved, to try them. To try who's them, the them that dwell upon the earth. Yeah, who's Is that the, those that got the left behind exactly, in the tribulation? Exactly. Yeah. Not you know, to, yeah. Not sound, to not sound flippant or whatever, those that miss the boat. Right? When we think about Noah's flood, people chose not to get on board, man. This is why you're here. This is why we're here as a church. This is why that sign is you're entering the mission field. What's part of the mission field? To proclaim the gospel. That's what these guys were doing in the Philadelphia church age. That's what they were known for, the evangelical, the evangelistic church, the missionary church. What were they doing? They were proclaiming the good news. What's the good news? 1 Corinthians 15, the death, burial, and resurrection. That's the message. That's the gospel that we preach. Paul called it my gospel. That's our gospel. Now, the gospel message is going to change, and we'll see this when we get into the into chapter number six of the, of the book of Revelation. Um, the message that's going to be preached by the 144,000 is not the death, burial, and resurrection. Right? This whole Tim LaHaye stuff, that people are going to come to Jesus during the tribulation? No. Put the Revelation chart back up real quick, Larry. Check this out. I, I want you guys to see it. This is why you guys need to master this chart. Look at this. How are people saved in the church age? Grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, Romans 10, 9 and 13, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. How was somebody saved in the tribulation period? Endure to the end and refuse the mark. There is no come to Jesus. There is no belief in your heart. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved. No. You're going to have to endure to the end. That's clear in Matthew 24. And don't take the mark. And then how are you saved In the millennium, the whole world's going to keep the law. We're back to a, hey man, Leviticus, Numbers, animal sacrifices. Wait till we get and study some of the things that are going to happen and reveal to us in places like Zacharias chapters 13 and 14, the millennial reign. Dennis? I have a question, John. So I'm confused because you say that... uh, the end and to endure to the end that that people can't come to christ during the tribulation uh so if you endure to the end and even though you're not a believer or don't believe that's a little confusing you no, still it, make heaven your I'll, home I'll, or I'll, I'll tell you what's not confusing because is there will be a hundred and forty four thousand preachers proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. We're going to see that when we get to Revelation 7 and 14, and we're going to learn what their message is. Their gospel message is different than ours. That's what you have to understand. They're preaching exactly the same message that Jesus preached when he was here, right? It was called the gospel of the kingdom. What's the gospel of the kingdom? What's the good news? The king is coming. That's the message that they're going to be preaching. And guess what? There's going to be people that are going to say, man, I want no part of this Antichrist crap. And I'm going to join forces with the sheep nations. Right? The sheep and goat nations in Matthew 25. The salvation in the tribulation period is not personal. It's national. You're either going to be a sheep nation or a goat nation. You're either going to support Israel or you're not. And that's where he's going to unleash hell. When I say he, the Antichrist and his forces. That's the great tribulation. So those aren't my words. Matthew 24, 13, Jesus says, endure to the end, and thou shalt be saved. When I first read that verse, I didn't know what it meant. What does that mean to me? I'm thinking, and you know, I'm hearing this word saved for the first time in my life, and I'm starting to read the Bible for the first time in my life, and I'm reading Matthew 24, and I say, what, is, what do I need to do to be saved? I need to endure to the end? until somebody taught me how to rightly divide the word of truth in the context of Matthew 24, which is tribulation period, he's talking to Jews. He's talking to Israel. The Mount of Olives. Are you with me, Dennis? Does that make sense? I hope it does. Yeah, yeah. So what you're 
you're saying is that you have at, during that time you'll have the two sides. Yes, so it's exactly what you're sides. doing. It's exactly what you're so doing. Either, you're either pro-Israel or you're going to be anti-Israel in the, in the tribulation period. God's going to deal with a national salvation. He's going to deal with nations. You're either a sheep nation or a goat nation. It has nothing to do with a personal salvation. That's called Matthew 25, the judgment of the nations. We'll, talk, we'll unpack the seven judgments at some point. They're in your booklet, the seven judgments. And he's going to judge the nations, right? You know where he's going to judge the nations? Right there in, from the Mount of Olives. What's crazy today, and I think I mentioned it last week, there's a little church in the valley known as the Church of the Nations where he's going to split the valley right there in the Mount of Olives. And all the nations will be gathered there and he's going to judge them. You're going to see that in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, Matthew 25. You're, there's only going to be two groups of people, the sheep and the goats. And it's not sheep and goat people. It's sheep and goat nations. So you know what I'm going to tell people? You know what my last final note to people that I love and care for and say, hey, man, if you choose to stay behind, and it's a choice, um, pack your bags Move to Israel and become a Jew. And start following the message of those 144,000 dudes, what I refer to as the real Jehovah Witnesses. Not these fake ones that are out here in America. I'm just sorry, but these 144,000, mm-hmm. they're, they're preaching the same gospel they came to Christ on, right? Exactly, exactly. Absolutely. So, in essence, yeah. Yeah. Look, look at Matthew twenty-four. In in that sense, yes. You know what you're, but but you're not. I think the distinction I'm trying to draw um, is I want us to understand, Ron, that it's not a personal salvation; it's a national salvation. Watch this. Look at Matthew twenty-four. It's um. It's. You're justified by whether or not you're going to line up to make your way. Do you not find it interesting? Do you not find it interesting that in Matthew chapter number 7, I believe it is, when, when if, your, if your eye offend you, cut it, or pluck it out, and if your arm offend you, you know, what, you know what's crazy? <laughs> there was this dude that was in our church in Kansas. He was a big church that literally plucked his eye out. He literally did that. He's a little bit on the wacky side. And... Uh, you know, you know what I believe that's all about? Because if you look at Matthew's chapters 5, 6, and 7, the context is the Sermon on the Mount, which is the constitution of the kingdom. In other words, those folks that are going to survive, endure to the end, might have taken the chip. I'm, not, I'm just thinking out loud these crazy thoughts that I contrive when I'm reading the scriptures. And to make it in the millennium? Right? Because that's where the chip's going to go. On your right hand or your right eye. Before to your right eye. So there's going to be people that are going to take the chip that may survive, endure to the end, that took the mark, but they're going to cut it off before they enter into the millennial kingdom. I don't know for sure, but it's there. What's the context of that passage? What's the context of that passage? The... the um, the um, uh, constitution of the kingdom, the Sermon on the Mount. Where was I taking? Look at Matthew 24 real quick. <laughs> Look at verse number, um, verse number 11. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Verse 12. And because iniquity shall abound and the love of many shall wax cold, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Are you with me? Now look at verse 14. And this gospel of the what? It's not the gospel of grace. It's the gospel of the king. If you go all the way back to Matthew chapter 9, when Jesus shows up and he sees the multitude and his, he was moved with compassion, you know what the Bible says he was preaching? He was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. What's the gospel of the kingdom? I'm here. The kingdom's here. The king, I'm, the, I'm here. The kingdom's here. Accept it. That's the message in the trib that these 144,000 dudes are going to be preaching. And people are either going to line up and accept that, the proclaimers of that kingdom, or not. So it's not a personal salvation. 
It's not a personal salvation. Like all these movies, the Tim LaHaye movies, Left Behind. Um, what's that crazy movie from the 60s that my wife got saved when she watched it? What was it called, Larry? That freaky movie? What was it called? Huh? Thief in the Night. <laughs> We watched it the other day. It was on one of those old stations, and I said, wow, this is really corny. <laughs> no, I'm serious. There is no indwelling. He's going to work outwardly. He's, gonna be, he's still present, but he's working. Out. There is no indwelling of the Spirit in the, in the trib, right? The Jews in the Old Testament, the Jews in the Old Testament were never, were never, um, were, were never, um, granted that gift of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Only the believer, only the Christian, only the church age. Right? Yes, Michelle. We're going to stay here. I, I'm sorry. Go for it. it. It just occurred to me in Acts number one when huh? Jesus comes back and he's with these apostles and he says, you know, you have uh-huh. said earlier, uh, when is the kingdom? And he said, it's not for you. To know. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Yeah, keep in mind what he goes on. He says next, don't go anywhere. Stay in Jerusalem because I'm gonna, I'm gonna be sending my Holy Spirit, who's gonna give you, who's gonna give you power, power to do what, the power to, to stay true to the charge of being His witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost. So in Acts chapter two, Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes down. He doesn't indwell them then. He indwelled them in John chapter 20 when Jesus shows up after the resurrection and he breathed under him and they received the Holy Spirit. That's when they, his Holy Spirit. Do you remember when you got saved? When you got saved, you had no clue that the Holy Spirit was indwelling you. You know when he empowers you, when he starts to transform, he begins to use you in mighty ways. That's, that's what happens at Pentecost. He empowers them. I'm sending you my spirit. He's going to give you the power to be these witnesses that I've called you to be. Now, here's what's cool about the Lord. He's given them one more chance with Stephen. He gives them one more chance, and then he was done. Now, here's what I know about God. This is the difference between what I would consider foreknowledge and, and predestination. What God knew. God knew the Jews would reject him. But this whole idea of free will is always part of his purpose and his plan. It's always about free will. He always gives a choice. You want to see a crazy thing in Acts chapter 7? We might as well stay here till 10. Yeah. <laughs> no, check this out. People this, you know, you read this, you read this passage in Acts chapter 7 where um, Stephen gets stoned and I've heard, and I've heard crazy things of these preachers that say, oh, look at the Lord. Look at the Lord um, standing up to receive this great proclaimer of the gospel. You know why I believe Jesus stood up? Because he was mad. <laughs> yeah, perhaps. I'll tell you why he stood up. Watch this. Um, look at chapter the, the end of chapter 7. Um, verse 54, And when they heard these things, these are the religious dudes, the Jews that were present. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth, But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. This is what Stephen saw. Anytime you see the glory of God, what's playing out? What's the context? What's the context, event-wise? The second coming. The second coming, the glory of God. And Jesus, what? Standing, not sitting like he did after he resurrected, but standing on the right hand of the Father. You know what I believe? He was ready to come back if these Jews would have just accepted him, accepted the message. He's all about free will. He's standing, man. When he stands up, he's ready to move. So what do you do? After they rejected him, they still him, they call him, sat back down. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go save the Samaritans and the Ethiopian eunuch in the very next chapter. And then Paul in chapter 9, and then the Roman dude, Cornelius, in chapter 10. And then chapter 11, no longer is Jerusalem significant, now it's Antioch. Isn't God good, man? 
Because at the end of the day, he had you in mind. Nobody knows except God how long the church, how long the church age was going to last. That's what I was getting at earlier when we were talking about progressive revelation. What we know today, we're privileged to have the revelation that we have. These guys didn't have a complete Bible. You do. We have no excuse. Anyway, thank you, Lord, for our, word, for your, our time, for your word. And, uh, Lord, just prepare our hearts for next week, which is, uh, which is heavy because it's, a, it's a, a portion of Scripture that reveals so much to us about us. And Lord, I just pray that you would and will prepare our hearts. In Jesus' name, Lord, amen. God bless you all. We appreciate you. Love you. Thanks for your patience.